First of all, when you think about it, what does Proto-Indo-European sound like is a super big question. It's like asking, what do you think is good? Or, do you prefer chocolate or pop music? Therefore, before we can even begin to answer this, we should probably rephrase it into something more concrete. So, every language has a specific set of sounds and rules of how these sounds go together that it uses when forming words. We know this is true because if someone says, that guy over there looks a bit shumpy, you're probably going to ask, what does shumpy mean? Well, if someone says, can you pass me a little bit of the you'll probably distance yourself a few meters and then probably call the police. In other words, the word shumpy could be an English word even though it isn't, while can never be an actual word in English. This fact is also the reason why people say, Russia has quite a strong army, instead of, Russia has quite a strong army. This is because English and French have conflicting sets of sounds and rules, that is, English and French have different phonologies. Now, to go back to the actual topic, when we ask what did Proto-Indo-European sound like, what we really mean is what was the phonology of Proto-Indo-European. Now, how can we find this out? Well, what we first need to do is find some similar words in both sound and especially in meaning. For example, English foot, Lithuanian peda, Greek bodhi, and Latin pes, all of which mean foot. Or English father, Latin pater, Sanskrit piter, ancient Greek pater, all of which bearing the meaning father. Now, there's plenty of other examples here, but more of the story is that we can see that all these languages have a but at the start there except English. But because the majority of the languages have a but there, we can assume that Proto-Indo-European had a but sound in its phonology. Simple enough, right? Well, let's drive some other sounds. Now, here's the thing. Some of these corresponding sounds are actually slightly more problematic. For example, let's look at the following set of words. Church Slavonic bero, Armenian berem, English bear, but Sanskrit barami, Ancient Greek pero, and Latin fero. Now, this time the majority doesn't win because if we reconstruct but for these languages, we would actually expect Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin to have a but there. Instead, we have to try some different logic. So, some sound changes are more likely than others. Namely, number one, the ones that require the least amount of steps, and number two, the ones that require the least amount of effort. In addition, to further help look for most likely sound changes, we usually look at what we know has historically happened in the languages we actually have records of. Anyway, let's list some possibilities. If we take but as the original sound, as we said, we would expect Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit to have a but. But they all disagree on the sound, so but can't be the case. If we take but as the original, then all these other languages will require two steps to coincidentally get the but, and then Sanskrit will probably take an extra additional step there. If we take fu as the original, then basically the same thing happens with pu, only some of the changes would require the sound to take even more effort to pronounce, so that's a no-go. Now, what we have left is bu. I mean, if you think about it, it makes sense. Getting from bu to both bu and Greek pu takes only one step, and both changes seem pretty likely to happen. And Latin then took pu and made it into fu, which is a likely change, as we've been able to see it happen in modern Greek and German. So we now have an extra reconstructed sound. Let's now apply the same logic to reconstruct a few more otherwise problematic ones. Wait, gain ka versus zanja? Yeah, okay, let's try another set. Okay, yeah, this doesn't work either. Well, what seems to be happening is that there's two different groups of languages. One has punchy sounds like gain ka, while the other has hissy sounds like zhen zha. Let's dive into that into another episode. For now, let's just move on to the vowels. Using the same example words, we can see that German has O as well as Greek, and Latvian has E, and Slavic has E. Right, yeah, this isn't really working. Looks like we're going to have to cover this in a separate episode as well. Okay, if you thought these are all the mysteries we have to uncover, you're in for a ride. Did you even notice how English loves to be a special snowflake here? What about the rest of the words? We've only really been focusing on one letter. Where the hell did linguistic deviation happen anyway? Yeah, okay, okay, let's slow down. No need to worry about these for now, they will all be answered eventually. So, we've looked into what sounds and rules Proto-Indo-European used when forming its words. Upon reconstructing, we've noticed that, firstly, some sounds are easy to reconstruct. Dugga, ba, dugga, ba, dugga, and ba, we've got so far. But then there's the family feud of whether or not hissing is the next best thing. And lastly, vowels are super random and must follow some other set of rules. So, to end this episode off, let's play a game of Which of these exceptions in the Proto-Collection will we give some more inspection? And the winner is Team K versus Team S.